I grabbed all the Spotify charts from all over the globe for a single week, right? There were 12 countries Mm -hmm. in which the number one track in that country appeared on no other chart at all. Mm. And that's what we mean by hyperlocal. Hi, I'm Hazel Savage, and this time I'm speaking to Christine Osazua, who's the Chief Strategy Officer at UK events platform Shubes, as well as the founder of the amazing Measure of Music conference and hackathon. In this episode, we'll talk about trends in African music, calculated risks and unconventional career paths in music. So thank you so much, Christine, for coming on the podcast. I am very uh, pleased to say that I know you well, but... For those people listening in who might not, how do you like to introduce yourself? Oh, gosh. So I usually start off with saying I'm Christina Sazwa. Um, Despite the accent, I live in London, um, but I'm from Baltimore. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, I've worked in the music industry about 20 years now. Um, Everything from major label to live to the star space. um, And I run a conference as well. My current job, I am Chief Strategy Officer for Shibs, which is a white combinator company that focuses on black music and culture. And we specifically handle event ticketing, event marketing, and overall general marketing, including artist marketing. That's what pays my rent. Um, and then I run a conference called Measure of Music, which is a music tech and data conference and hackathon that happens annually. Um, and then I sit on a couple of boards and nonprofits as well to keep to fill in all that free time that I have, you see. I was going to say, just a couple of things. Yeah, just, just a few. Just a couple, just a couple yeah. of bits here and there. Um, and uh, one thing I did want to touch on, uh, because because I think we have this in common, is that you have an emo background. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> it will never did die. Did we all get our start in the emo oh, world? Oh, gosh. All the, good, all the cool people did, obviously. Okay. Um, I It will never die. Fall Out Boy has been my favorite band for 20 years. Fall Out Boy will continue to be my favorite band, probably for an additional 20 years. Yeah. Um, and I literally today was working out and booking my flights to go to When We Were Young Festival to be in... in Vegas for approximately 48 hours so I can watch a bunch of pop punk and emo bands play their albums in entirety, which I'm really excited about. Nice. But yeah, I did get my start working on Warp Tour, um, booking pop punk bands, and that's what I started at 15 doing. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's never gone away. See, so my favorite band in this world is Alkaline Trio. Oh, God. I was ju- I literally on the tube over, I was listening to Alkaline Trio. Ugh. Yes. I pre-ordered the new album on CD Very because good. that's how old I am. I love that. And I'm obsessed. And then um but then most people know Matt Skiba now from being Blink like too. he was the Blink guy yeah. for a couple of years. Um but obviously I'm an OG fan. Yes, of course. So I and I'm into the original band, but I also saw them on the Warp Tour. Yes. Maybe like, I don't know, at least ten years ago in the US. I went to the New Jersey branch of the Warp oh, yes, Tour. Yes. Like it's just like a friend of a friend had a ticket. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I was just I would just be like yes to anything where Alkaline Trio were playing. Fair. Um but that was that was kind of my side of uh, the of the emo world. I was into Alkaline Trio, Jimmy Eat World, yep. um that kind of thing. Yes, Jimmy Eat World's also one of my favorite bands. Um I almost uh, almost walked down the aisle to the Jimmy Eat World song. I walked down the aisle to a Foo Fire song when I got married instead. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Which Foo Fire song? Um, Everlong Acoustic on a guitar oh, live. <laughs> that is a beautiful song. It is that a That is a really song. beautiful song. Yeah, I yes. love that you had the Foo Fires. Yes. So good. Yes, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, so we've got the emo background. Yes. So I don't think I knew that you worked on the Warped Tour. Yeah. I think that's new information to yeah. me. What what were you doing at the Warped Tour? Were you like a booker? No, no. So it was very unofficial because like the rock and roll world and the the way the world worked then was it's all very unofficial. So basically, I'll, I'll take a step back for a bit. So uh, <laughs> when I was I guess sixteen was the first time I ever went to Warped Tour, um, um, and. It was a year randomly where it started in Baltimore, which where I was from. Um, yeah. And so they were like setting up still. And so I had one like backstage passes or whatever. Um, and so I got there and I was like, cool, what am I supposed to do with this? And so I wandered into like the production area where the offices were. And I was like, hey, do you guys need any help with anything? And they're like, yeah, sure. Go ahead and, and help us put these stickers on the buses and do this thing. So I like wander around and just like did random setup bits um, for <laughs> like part of the day. And then I watched the bands the other part of the day. It was, I was like, just my day. Yeah. Um, it was super fun. I loved that. Next year I came back. I ran a magazine. Um, called Scene Trash Magazine. It was a print magazine, um, which was like, this was in the blogger area, era, like MySpace era. So like doing a print magazine was actually pretty like subversive at the time. So I ran yeah. a print magazine. Um, and so I started interviewing bands. I got approved for press on Warp Tour by the next year I went. Um, and so I was doing press and doing interviews. While I was doing that, I met the press coordinator, who's a friend now, uh, Bethany, um, who was doing all the press and like handling it. And so in the markets that I normally would go to, we Baltimore, New Jersey, the Mid-Atlantic region, which 
tend to be really busy regions. And so I yeah. just ended up start, starting to help her out um, every, you know, for basically like a week or two weeks stretch of time um, because like those are the times where she didn't really have as much support. And I was like, cool, I can just help out. And so I was doing my interviews and while I wasn't doing my own interviews, I would just help her out. So I did that for usually one to two weeks every year for yeah. several years in a row, basically. Yeah. Again, super unofficial. There was no, I, I didn't have a title or anything like yeah, that. I just yeah. assisted her. Um, I did my interviews um, and then I had a booth for my magazine. So I had my staff running the booth of the magazine. I was interviewing bands um, and then I made a documentary about how social media um, and fandom kind of interacted, especially in the pop punk world. So I yeah. did, and I did film my documentary while I was on Warp Tour as well as a couple other um, tours and festivals and things like that during the during those years as well. So, See, I am yeah. learning so <laughs> much but i think my favorite takeaway was you won backstage passes and you just started working yeah <laughs> you just which said started. a lot about me as a person yeah you just were like you sh- you showed up and you were like i'm just gonna chip in because yeah. i can see a few things here that are not working things aren't set up yet clearly things, um. things aren't running <laughs> and i'm a guest but yes. i'm gonna help yeah so do you wash up in other people's homes so I don't do this because <laughs> it's very much that energy. It is that energy, um, and so I. This is. It's just gonna sound terrible. Um, and my husband's gonna be like Christine um, when he hears this. But I have two things about this. First of all, I am in no way built for domestic labor. Um, okay. Like, uh, yeah. Same. I'm not in any way. Um, I've learned this very early on to my parents' chagrin. I am not in any way built for that. So never do that. Yeah. There's a lot of other things I will step into people's like. If someone's like, "Hey, Christine, I need help with finances. You, I'm your girl. Yeah. I will. We will Hold step in and we'll do it." Um, yeah, you Immediately, out. without any hesitation. But when it comes to domestic labor, I don't um, do that. Yeah. Um, and then part of the reason is because when people are a guest in my home, I would never expect them to clean a single thing. Um, so I will not be doing that in your home. I'm sorry. No. But happy to help with all kinds of other stuff. Honestly, <laughs> boundaries. <laughs> exactly. Also important. Also important. But yeah, okay. Good to know on the finance side. Yes. Um, so if I ever just, I'll just put all my receipts in a big old briefcase, yes. like very traditional briefcase, yes, and yes. we'll take it from there. I just I, like envisioning you going to the store and purchasing a briefcase. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's it's going to be monogrammed. I love this yeah. idea, personally. Thank you yes. very much. Um, and the other thing I was excited. So firstly, I love that you went to the Warp Tour and just gave yourself a job. Yep. That's one of my favorite things I've heard today. And then the other thing I really enjoyed hearing was that while you were running the print mag, I was probably writing for Big Cheese magazine oh. in London at the same time, which was a pop punk print mag. I love that. And so I think we were living parallel lives. Very good. Um, in uh, uh, on the either pond. side yeah. of the yeah. of the pond. I love that. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, and not so not, but there was no internet at the time, yeah. so we couldn't tell each other. Exactly. Oh, there, but... I mean, there was internet, but it was very very rudimentary at yeah. the time. I was also a web developer, so I started. I also got my start building websites for artists, um, right. like for the bands, um, doing like graphic design work, helping yeah. people make really cool MySpace pages. Were oh, all like I jobs did used I had. to. Yeah. I used to manage a couple of bands, yeah. and when I say manage bands, I mostly edited their HTML code exactly. on their MySpace, pa- yep. MySpace page. I ran street teams, and that also somehow involved me editing HTML code on people's yeah. MySpace pages. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Basically, <laughs> one of my main uh, skills was I could remove all adverts. Ooh. You know, I could find where they dropped in a few of the visual adverts, and I could just take them out. Very good. Exactly. I would just like remodel entire. Like I just moved things around entirely. It looked like a whole like your own personal website by the time I was done. It was great. Um, yeah, I was. I was mainly just uh, you know subverting the uh, the ad ad culture. Very good in, uh, and, in the UK, and that is why MySpace no longer exists. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> It's mostly on me. Yes, exactly. Um, but, okay, so I love that we've been living parallel lives. Yes. Good to know. Yes. I want to jump forward a little bit as well, because I know that and we and in this podcast, we will be able to link back to all these amazing articles. I know that Shubes and Musio by SoundCloud partnered recently to do the Amapiano article to really deep dive on this genre. And we pulled in Chartmetric as well. We sure did. They, we had a third partner on yeah. that one. And I wanted to to dig in on this with you um, because it seems like the, the stage is set. This genre, it hasn't come from nowhere, but it's, but it's, it's, it's getting rising. big. Yeah. It's rising. Yeah. So what is it, what is it to you that's exciting about this, about seeing a genre like I'm a Piano come out? Yeah. I mean, so I am truly excited about the African culture continent as a whole. Um, first of all, I'm Nigerian. I'm first-generation American. I am 100% Nigerian, so I have just like a seated interest in the growth and the prolification of Africa as a whole, um, West Africa especially. Um, but what's really exciting to me about I'm a Piano, first of all, even stepping away from the, the genre itself for a moment, is 
opening up the continent. So right now, when people mm. hear African music, they default to Afrobeats. They yep. think, which is Nigeria, which is Ghana, that's essentially it. Um, yep. There's a couple other, like, you know, bits and pieces, but people think Afrobeats, and that is it. So the introduction of Ama Piano is South Africa. It is so far away from Ghana and Nigeria, literally ge- geographically, that you can't just lump all of them together anymore, yeah. right? And so that makes the continent more open. And so when people start talking about Africa, they can't just say Afrobeats. There's going to be more, right? right? Which is super exciting to me because that also means like there's um, another emerging genre we're looking at right now coming out of French speaking um, Africa. Um, oh. So Francophile Africa, basically. Yeah. Um, so Congo, Mali, for example. And we're seeing music coming out of there, coming into the UK right now. Um, there's an artist, uh, Ai Nakamura, um, Fali Pupa, um, Niho, um, are all coming out of that uh, out of like French speaking Africa, um, and that's exciting because that's a that's a third place, right? Yeah, and yeah. then I'm having really early conversations with people out in like Tanzania, looking at East Africa, and that's the fourth place. And then all of a sudden we have a, a whole continent, right? Yeah. That's super exciting um, just from that standpoint because that opens up the whole world. You know how many people live in Africa? A lot of people live in Africa. Um, it is a huge population. There's lots and lots of talent out of there. And then there's also growing middle class out of there as well. And mm-hmm. so there's all this there's opportunity for spend and money. And there's a whole other area that I'm exploring about people are traveling. The diaspora as a whole, the black diaspora as a whole, travels down to Africa yeah. during um, Christmas um, and like the, the holiday season, basically. Yeah. That's super exciting. Well, I was I was going to say, and it, it, uh, from, from where I sit mm-hmm. in kind of the music tech world, mm-hmm. uh, I'm seeing a ton of innovation and investment like it seems like the startup scene is exploding yeah. it's almost like if you're not investing in a in a in a syndicate or a fund that's putting money into african startups yeah. then you're behind you're missing curve. out you're yeah. missing out and this one thing that's also really interesting is that there's this added advantage so we had um for measure music we had a startup that pitched out of um africa out of um, nigeria um and i'm i blanking on the name oh it's they're called maj um m-a-g-e yes um and they are doing financing for artists and creatives um out of nigeria and someone in the audience you know asked a question like oh how is this different than all the other you know companies that are doing similar work and you know the um the founder answered and gave a great answer and i also just added it i was like how many of those companies are investing in africa how many of those companies are willing to write a check to someone in nigeria how many of those companies even have the infrastructure to be able to pay people in nigeria and go through all those 100%. questions at the time but 100%. like those are all the questions so there's also this added advantage of just like understanding the market yeah. um, and for Shrubs sp- specifically the re- another reason why we're really excited about Africa is because we've been working with Ghana and Nigeria and South Africa for years now so mm-hmm. we know the people on the ground we know the infrastructure we know the payment process we know all of these things already yeah. and so while bigger companies may not have been willing to play in the Africa space for a really long time we've, we've done that we've made the contacts we've made the connections so it's really exciting for us because we're like cool let's, let's go yeah um, <laughs> so I, it's it's a growing area. I see it from an innovation perspective, yeah. but all these these genres, which that creativity and that that musicality was probably always there, but maybe now we just have the streaming services and the infrastructure yeah. for it to to kind Absolutely. of cut through everywhere. Absolutely. And um, let's be real, um, Spotify only came to Nigeria only a couple of years ago, for right. example. Um, YouTube is the biggest DSP in the world, obviously always has been, um, but there's the DSPs are just getting there, um, so there's that component of it. But also, the reason why one genre is important to open up all the other ones is because that's what's happened, right? Right. Um, and I, th- I think something that people don't realize often, um, and I talk to people about artist development a lot, um, and I love talking about artist development, but I think there's that missing piece people fail to realize is that in order for an artist to take off, they need contemporaries, they need counterparts, they need other people with them. Mm. You can't start a movement with just one artist. When we had the whole conversation about pop punk, the reason why we had a whole conversation about pop punk it was not just because of My Chemical Romance, not just because of Fall Out Boy, or not yeah, just yeah, because yeah. of Jimmy Eat World. It was because of five dozen artists that yeah. were all around that same time with a very Creative similar scene. sound. And so when I talk about certain genres, part of the reason why they haven't taken off yet is because there's not enough, right? Mm-hmm. Um, a big example of that I would say would be an artist, like would be like Grime. I, like UK Grime is really cool, really interesting. But in terms of mega stars in that space, it's just Stormzy. Yeah. It's just Stormzy. And yeah. You, you can't make grime a thing in the U.S. or in other countries with just one artist, right? Mm-hmm. And so th- it's incredibly important to grow the entire scene. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that there's not lots of efforts to do so. Like, grime is very big here. There's, not, there's plenty of efforts, but that's an example of why it's really challenging. Yeah. Um, and so when we're seeing all this growth now, it's... Burner Boy 
play Madison Square Garden, you know, Yay. you sold them out, you know, <laughs> like, you know, Rema had a number one track, you know, like all of these things have to happen. It can't just be one artist is winning a bunch of awards or, you know, getting a number one track, whatever it might be. It has to be all these things, you know, Uncle Waffles, um, you know, I'm a piano artist, uh, you know, she played Coachella for the first time. Like all yeah. of these like layering of things is what it takes to like make this happen. It can't to just be one thing. come into the cultural awareness to, to expand further than just than just your scene yeah. or your 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 geographical local exactly. scene. Exactly. Um, and the thing that we're seeing as well at, at SoundCloud more than ever is 10 or 20 years ago um and SoundCloud is only 16 years old but 10 <laughs> but in the industry mm-hmm. in general, you know, a UK or a US artist could put out a record, it's obviously it's going to be in English and that will go big globally/ slash everywhere. Mm-hmm. And because everywhere will go that's music. Mm-hmm. And what we're now seeing is that 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 music is no longer that much of interest to people in the Middle East. They want to hear it in Arabic Mm -hmm. or people in the African countries. They want to hear local genres. They want to hear local dialects. Mm -hmm. They want to hear local languages. And and, in Japan, they're they're listening to Japanese music. Mm -hmm. In France, they're listening to French language. Mm -hmm. And this is true everywhere. So there's more opportunity and you're seeing more local global stars, Mm -hmm. but it's it's possibly a reduction in the English speaking market. Yes. Um, and I I've I started waving that flag a few years back when I was at Major and was Label. Was anyone listening? Um, unfortunately no. <laughs> um, I won't say which uh, label, but unfortunately they I don't think they heard me at the time. But yeah. I was like, if you look at the the highest grossing artists in that the year in question, I was like, look how many of them are from the Western world. It's less than it used to be. Yeah. And I was flagging that because that label of time was missing artists outside of that of the western world in terms of major artists i was like this is going to pose a problem very shortly for you um Mm. because who is going to fill the void here um and so that's something that i've been very much aware of um i remember looking at i took um just a snapshot to give a example of what this is right so i took a snapshot of a single week on the spotify charts i grabbed all the spotify charts from all over the globe for a single week right And what I found on that chart is that there were 12 countries Mm -hmm. in which the number one track in that country appeared on no other chart at all. Mm. Context there again. 12 countries where the number one track, so the track people were listening to the most in that country, didn't even appear in anybody else's chart. Yeah. 200 songs. It's across what, 50 countries at the time, whatever it might have been, it didn't, didn't even, wasn't even there. And that's what we mean by hyperlocal, right? Yeah, like, yeah. This is, you walk down the street in that country and someone would probably be singing that song. And if you were, went to the neighboring country next door, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you would have heard of them. Whereas, whereas yeah. back in the day, yeah. that's Brian impossible. Adams is number one. Right. He's number one all yeah. over the world. Yeah, maybe he's number four or five somewhere else, but he's number one. Like, yeah. Everyone's heard the song. Everyone's heard the song. But you could have been, I remember that one of that, well, I was like in that week, one of the tracks in the, of those 12 one was in Sweden, which means the neighboring Nordic countries yeah. were not listening to that track. Yeah. You know? like, yeah. like Sweden only has 10 million people in it. And, and um, I think this is true as well. Like, wasn't it in the last couple of years, like Bad Bunny has consistently been the number one artist in the world, the number one artist in the Depending world. I how you calculate it. Yeah. If you were going to give me a million quid right now, I could not sing you a Bad Bunny song. <laughs> I think that says more about me, not about them. Fair, yeah. I actually love, because um, I'm really into Zumba. Mm-hmm. So I'm really into like Don Omar. Yeah. I'm into Enrique. Mm-hmm. I am really into my Lat- Latin American music, yeah. but I haven't haven't hit the Bad Bunny thing yet. Which is fair because it's a very specific sound too. I'm, yeah. I I can name you a Bad Bunny track, but like it is also trap. Um, oh, which okay. it, it's like, it's, it's, it's Latin hip hop. It's Latin trap music, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's a very specific sound. So if you didn't like non Latin trap, you probably won't like Bunny, Bad Bunny gonna from. They're not going to play that at Zumba, <laughs> are they? I'm not, they're not probably gonna... not. It's probably yeah. not the vibe. I hope um, so they do, but they might not like it because of that. Which is okay. There's no there's no fault there. Um, but I think it's at least another interesting conversation about like there's been a lot of conversations. I'm looking into this right now about the decline in hip hop. Um, yeah. And my one of the things I flag most frequently about the decline in hip hop is that there's not a decline in hip hop. There's just a decline in America. American hip hop. There's just a very specific type of hip hop because right. Bad Bunny makes hip hop. He may be doing it in Spanish, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but he is still creating hip hop, for example. Um, or the same with like a lot of Afrobeats is really hip hop inspired and influenced and things like that. Yeah. And again, it's just not coming out of North America. Yeah. Um, and and so- we see this on SoundCloud, mm-hmm. Persian rap. Oh, yeah. Um, yep. So maybe perhaps back in the day, those people would have listened to American yep. hip hop, but now they're listening to Persian rap instead. Because they have their own. And yep. so it's almost like, and, and the industry is, is still growing. Overall numbers are growing, but they're diversifying. Yep. It's becoming, like you say, that, that hyper-local. Yep. 
approach, um, which I think is really interesting because I feel like being from one of the countries, the UK, where we we used to just be used to, oh, we put a song out and yeah. everyone's going to love it. Having to realise that that might not be our reality you have to work um, for it. <laughs> is, uh, is interesting. Yes. Um, but I do think as well, when you said you were looking at this and you just described your approach with the Spotify charts, mm-hmm. is this coming from you having the data background? Yeah, so um, on my good days, I'm a data scientist. Um, <laughs> I don't know bad days. <laughs> Questionable. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, have a, I do have a degree in data science, and I am a data scientist. And so okay, um, tick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I think it counts, right? It definitely um, counts. And so um, this is something that I've been looking at. So one thing that's really exciting. So um, my last few jobs prior to my current job, um, I was working at Major Label, like I mentioned, um, which I I actually really enjoyed the work most of the time. Um, but we were looking at streaming numbers, mm. streaming numbers are anonymous um, for a lot of good reasons they're anonymous from the label side of things right yeah um, however um, I mean from a some reasons are bad why they're anonymous, but we'll start. Well, that's a different conversation. Um, <laughs> but on the flip side, um, I'm working in the ticketing space now. Um, so we do live music, we do concerts, we do festivals, things like that. And so I'm in the e commerce space, and e commerce is very much not anonymous, which is lovely. And so I have the full picture as to how people are spending, yeah. how people are behaving, how people are changing their buying habits. Yeah. Um, and so I've been starting to look into, you know, all of those people that maybe said that their number one, maybe their purchase behavior, so not just saying, but their number one purchase behavior was hip hop. How much of that has shifted and changed? Where have they gone? So yeah. is there a decline in hip hop? Is it additive? Um, is it, you know, shifting? Is Are they switching to other things? Um, and so I'm really excited. I've started doing this right now, so I wish I could give you like great insights right now. Um, but I've started looking into it. And what I've so far have found, at least, is that they there has been a decline in overall, like, you know, American hip hop that is being listened to um, or, you know, going to the events and things like that. But what I found really is that it's, they're just moving over. There, there's a lot more Afro beats. There's a lot more, more piano. Um, yeah. There's a lot more, like, African house. Um, yeah. The, the audience is moving and shifting and changing how they consume. Yeah. Um, but they're still it's consuming a lot of hip hop inspired music yeah. um, and they're still consuming a lot of black music as a whole right. mind you I do have, but we have a bias because our platform is focused on black music and culture but these people haven't left they haven't you know they yeah. haven't gone away they're yeah. still just buying they're buying differently yeah and I've I've found this to be kind of a, a truth within music mm-hmm. as well and something I, I can't quite remember how I first thought of it or maybe who first said it to me but it was you know the idea that if you ever go oh you know we need to tighten our belts as, a, as an individual or as a household you might go okay well I did have Netflix Disney Plus Hulu and HBO Max I could probably live with one instead of four but you know people don't go well I'll stop listening to music right that just isn't a it's not a behavior that happens because I can still get in my car and the radio I turn it on and I'm listening to to music right there and or you know if I I don't even want to spend the subscription. I can go to YouTube or SoundCloud and I can have the freemium ad funded experience. Yep. So it's not that you ever just have to go, I will just stop listening exactly. to music. You know, even dig out your old CDs. Exactly. You know, that that and, works. And then for us, we're in e commerce. So obviously, people spend. So there's a spend associated with it, but we also do clubbing events and other like lower cost events, so not just festivals and concerts. And oh, so yeah. even if you're not going to spend the money, maybe you can't afford the ticket for the festival or the concert, yeah. you can still pay five quid, ten quid, and yeah. go out, just go out dancing for the night. And yeah. so we, that's why I know that. That they haven't left. You know, yeah. you can you can see buying behavior and buying patterns still exist. That they're going yeah. to certain genres of music still, yeah. um, even if they can't afford to go to the concert or the festival. Because we are in a cost of living crisis, so like that is real. And it, but it's my theory that that that, that people don't leave music yeah. like the maybe the behavior shifts mm-hmm. and the the buying pattern shift with their with age and behavior i even got i got an advert for a, a club night the other night and it was all it was all like um like cheesy 90s pop music right. but it was for over 30s only amazing and i was like i am the target audience <laughs> I feel um, so seen. <laughs> I do. And I was like, I will pay five pounds to go to this night. But I also was like, also good ad targeting, whoever yes. hit me up with that advert. But again, it's it's not that people over 30, and I'm over 40 now, don't want to go to music. It's that if you're a bit older, you're maybe not discovering as much new music. Yes. Yes. So that's why you get, you get hit up with these other 
types of events. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's the whole thing where nostalgia th- hits. Yeah, studies have shown that people don't listen to new music after the age of like high school, basically, which makes me really sad. I think yeah, about it yeah. all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think I still I try I try to because yeah. I feel like, you know, if you're gonna work in this industry, it's uh, exactly. that's it's part of the part of the gig. But um but yeah, it's they they do say most people's their taste is fixed at, yeah. at fourteen. Yeah. Oh. Which um that's a bit of a shame, isn't it? Deeply upsetting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although we did just do that bit on emo, so I mean, hey, <laughs> I'm listening to new emo also. So oh, okay. good. Get, well, well, I need to get online with that. So, I, I, so you've got this, you've got this data science background. So I wanted to move on next to talk about one of my favorite conferences, not just because you're here, but Measure of Music. So tell us a little bit about. How long has it been running? Where'd the idea come from? Yeah, so Measure of Music, um, it's a music tech and data conference and hackathon. It's been going on for, we just had year four. Nice. Um, it started in the deep in the middle of COVID. Um, basically, at the time, I worked for a major label. I had a very secure job at the time. Things have changed since then. Um, but I had a very secure job at the time, um, and a lot of other people losing their jobs, um, especially in like, the live space, for example. Um, so a lot of people reach out to me on LinkedIn, and they're like, hey, Christine, um, can you have me, give me some advice, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, sure, of course. Um, and so I would do calls every week with people that wanted to chat. So I still do weekly calls on Mondays. There's group calls now, just a lot more people. Um, and so I was like, cool, this is not scalable. This I can't, I can only reach so many people. With... I'm doing a one-on-one conference every Monday. <laughs> exactly. I was like, oh, you know, and like, I would look at my calendar. I have a little like calendar link and it was like always full like six weeks out. I'm like, how annoying. Um, you know? <laughs> but I don't have any more time. I have no more free time. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do? Yeah, so yeah. instead of just like opening up like a second slot of hours or something like that, I decided to start an entire conference. Um, yeah. And so I came up with the idea. So I I was like, cool, what do I always tell people? And I was like, cool, I always tell people to put together a portfolio. I was like, put together something to show people, basically, yeah. especially if you're entry level or if, even if you're trying to like transition into the industry, whatever it might be. So I was like, cool, um, how did I help people do that? So I was like, I'll come up with this idea. And then we've mentioned them before. I caught my buddies a chart metric immediately. I was like, hey, you guys, I have this idea. Um, what do you think? They're like, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that response. Like, yeah, let's do it. They're pretty much always say yes to whatever random thing I've come up with. For the, I love that. Every year I come up with some new random thing I need them for. So they say yes, which is yes. lovely of them. Um, and so I was like, cool, I'm just going to hit up all my friends that work at all these various companies that I talk about all the time mm-hmm. and just have them talk about the things. So me, there's no point in me talking about chart metric when chart metric can talk about chart metric. Yeah, you know? perfect. There was no point the first year we had someone from Spotify talk about their API. There's no point in me talking about it. Someone else can talk yeah, about yeah. it. And so I just brought together all these people and I was like, cool, I have this idea. You know, and I started hitting up a few people I talked to before. I was like, I'm putting together this like hackathon thing. Would you be interested? And I was like, and a couple of companies are going to talk about their things. And everyone's like, yeah. And then I put out a little like, I think I put out a Google form, you know? Yeah. And I think it was like, oh, 50 spots maybe. And it filled up like hours. Within hours, I was like, oh, yeah, I was like, oh, I guess this is a thing. I yeah. guess I have to make it an actual real thing. Because other people were like, can I just watch? I don't want to do the thing. I was like, I, I guess. I don't have any. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, darling. I, I suppose. You yeah. know? And so I started piecing it all together. That's how I came up with year one. Yeah. Um, and so year one, 1,000 people signed up. Yeah. I was like, oh, my God. Um, year two, 2,000 people signed up. Um, you know? Yeah. Well, the thing I love about it the most, and I'm sure I'm not the only person that said it to you, and I, I don't even think this is a fresh take, but more than anything, Measure of Music is the thing I wish existed when I was 16, 17 and wanted to work in music. Yeah. Because I don't come from a, a musical family mm-hmm. background. I also come from the north of England mm-hmm. where – Back when I was getting my start, which is 20 years ago, you if you weren't in London, forget it. Yeah. There was nothing. And so what I didn't have was access to, to anyone in the industry, mm-hmm. never even met someone who mm-hmm. worked as an artist or a label or anything like that. Um, I probably couldn't have afforded to come down to London even if there was an event. Right. And how would I have found out about it? Yeah. This is like early days of the internet. Yeah. So it's the thing that I wish existed. Yeah. And when I see, I love that it's so accessible. Thank you. That is, is it still free? It's still free. Yeah, yeah. which I love. It's free. Um, it, as it's paid entirely by wonderful sponsors. So I always joke that I rob and hood away the money and give it out <laughs> to others. Um, so <laughs> it's paid for by wonderful sponsors. It's completely free. It's virtual and it will stay virtual because this we had 90 countries represented um, yeah. in terms of registrations um, and that's really important to me because I didn't grow up in the north of England but I grew up in Baltimore um, yeah. and Baltimore is what they refer to as a B market um, and so that there was no music industry in Baltimore you know Baltimore, right. you got lucky if there was a tour that popped in there instead of DC or Philadelphia um, right. and so I had a lot of the same issues it was, a, yeah. it was 
also a four hour journey for me to get to New York City. I ended up doing work there while I was growing up, but it yeah, was yeah. not like down yeah. the street, you know. Um, and so I always had wished like like I had this like access access mm. to the music industry. Um, and so the entire point of Measure Music is to give yeah. people access to the music industry, regardless of where they are or where they are in their career. Um, and then also I use it again, like I said, Robin Hood away all the money um, to pay my speakers. Um, so my speakers are majority minority and gender and race, and they have been every year, mm -hmm. as well as the participants in the hackathon have been. Um, and so it's incredibly important to me to have. The, my conference reflect what the world actually looks like um, yeah. and it's really easy to do that if it's a virtual conference I think I saw your hackathon winners this year it was an all women team it was all team. girls team we love to see it yes, yes. we <laughs> do I saw that and I was I think in all my years I've done a lot of hackathon mm -hmm. mentoring having built a, a startup myself and I don't think I've ever even mentored a, an all girl team oh. so to see to see an all girl team win was my heart was just like Mine too. It. It's funny because I make the teams, but they're pre pre outside of um, they're just randomly assigned. But outside of time zones, um, they're the time zones and skill set is how they're built, and that is it. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't even know I had pieced together an all woman team. Um, <laughs> because my um, my registrations are majority minority anyway, so it would have been there's no means in which I would have end up with the all male team. So I never bothered to kind of like check to make sure the gender oh, yeah, balance yeah, yeah, was yeah. fine. Cause I'm not yeah. really concerned. Um, and so I figured that out. I was like, there's an all woman team, and they just won. Um, because there was. And, and like, I know, like, people hear hackathon, they get really overwhelmed, they think all these things. Um, and so, like, I partner up skill sets. Um, so, um, literally, everyone has a little form they have to fill out, and they tell me, like, what, tell me your soft skills, your graphic design, your content creation, tell yeah. me your, like, hard skills, your web development, whatever. And so, I literally just piece together people. So, there's one person kind of representative, at least from each one. So, there was someone on the team that had a data background, and, like, that was, she was part of it, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And that's how it all came together. And they won. Do you ever get teams joining as a whole, like, joining as a preformed team? Year one, we had one team that I think was almost entirely um, had kind of like picked who they wanted. Since then, not really, um, because people's basically priorities change. You know, like yeah. so, like I, I give people the option to like pick out the people they want. Like I can say, I say, hey, if there's people you signed up with that you want to work with, go ahead and write their names in. Yeah, um, yeah. And I go and look them up, and like half the time, those people never didn't end up continuing <laughs> anyway. Yeah. And so right. I'm like, well, they didn't show up, so yeah. you're not going to be part of but them. I, I like that approach as well because <laughs> even some of the hackathons I've been to, you get almost like professional hackathon yeah, teams. Yeah, I don't love. That. Where there's three or four of them, yeah. and they go, they go around, yeah. and they they know there's, they have a formula to win. Yeah, I don't love that. So yeah. no, I I also so um, I like this. I like skills this are really important. So I also won't place even if you request. Um, if you request a t full team, I won't ever put together a whole team that would be stacked in a single way, and that's for their advantage or their disadvantage, depending. But like, I wouldn't put together like a team of like four data scientists and one graphic designer because it wouldn't make any sense. So mm -hmm. like, that's also a component of it to make yeah. sure that everyone's skill sets really evenly distributed. I do think one year, and I'm not 100% sure, but there's two people that request each other that have the same last name. So I think we might have had sisters, which I think is really cute. Um, so I need to like follow up and figure out that that was a thing as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And, you know, because when you first started Measure of Music four years ago, I think my assumption was, oh, it's, it's virtual because of COVID. COVID. Mm. And, and maybe it was even in the beginning, but actually what that's, you know, because I love an IRL. Yeah. I love a meet in real life. I love a face to face. I, you know, I, I, I find I find too much screen time a little bit draining. Yeah. But at the same time, what, what it's done, because it started virtual and it keeps the virtual component, is that's the accessibility. Yeah. Because as I say, if I was back in my hometown mm -hmm. up north, I wouldn't have been able to even if the conference was free, the cost of the hotel, the whatever, the mm -hmm. did I would not have been able to, to come. But the fact that it's completely online mm -hmm. and it's and it's free to join, it opens up the that world. opportunity to everyone. Absolutely. Um, and so we have introduced IRL components. Um, the hackathon every if the last two years, this year and the previous year, has two in-person locations where um, the hackathon teams can go in person and hang yeah. out there. So the first year was New York and Barcelona, and then this year was Philadelphia and Barcelona. Um, and so it's really cute to see the pictures. Everyone gets to hang out together and yeah. do their hackathon together. And like people can like people, some people even flew over from other places to go, which well, was hey, really and cool. If that's their office, yeah. they can. That's, that's brilliant. <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to say about uh, measure Measure of Music is... It started showing up on CVs that we get at SoundCloud. Nothing warms my heart more than and this. <laughs> like, and honestly, it's become like a, a kind of like a, a badge of success because also I've had some of my developers mentor at, at the hackathon. I know my team have been involved as speakers in the past and we've been a sponsor. We really love this event. And, and just the quality of people that attend and how like it's maybe one of the 
talks that I've done where I got the most questions. Because, yeah. you know, sometimes people are shy and sometimes people don't want to talk, but they grilled <laughs> me on various aspects of, of what I do. It's a really highly, highly super engaged audience. Yeah. So when we see that come through on a CV, we at SoundCloud, we go, oh, this person's this person's hustling. Yeah. They're interested. They've got a data a mind, that kind of thought process. And we do, we've seen some really impressive people come through. So, so that's kind of a success story that- for thrills me um but what are the what are the success stories are you seeing on your side yeah i mean that personally is why i consider success story too because i hear this from multiple companies like <laughs> it genuinely nothing thrills me more than this like oh, i thought we were special like, and unique oh, now everyone's in on it. no i mean like it's like the best kept secret in the music industry apparently yeah. um, but like i constantly will get notes from those companies so like i saw someone that had measured music on their cv so i oh i immediately gave them an interview yeah. and that thrills me um, because yeah. I agree like I have hired people from Measure of Music as well I have recommended people from Measure of Music because it's not an easy feat so like we get somewhere in the ballpark of about 200 people registered for the hackathon uh-huh. and by the so by the time the hackathon ends on the Sunday of the event the most we've ever had complete was 95-ish people. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So only 50% of the people actually make it all the way through to the end. Yeah, like, yeah. And so the amount of effort and, like, ambition and tenacity and, like, drive to make it to the end is incredibly important. Yeah. Like, it's impressive. But also the willingness to spend 48 hours of your life working on a music data project yeah. that you're not being paid for yeah. also is incredibly impressive as, like, conceptually. So I'm like, this person has all of the things I would be looking for to hire. And so Absolutely. constantly, every, everybody I know that, like, the people reach out constantly and tell me they, they interview someone from Measure Music constantly. It's yeah. I have so many success stories. People have gotten jobs. All like I have one. He is like my crowning jewel because he somehow managed to get two jobs. Measure of music, which is incredibly <laughs> impressive. So he did first year. My my friend Michaela, he's at Atlantic Records UK now. He did the first year. Got an internship at a label. It's great, awesome, right? And then he somehow managed to also get a job at Atlantic Records from one of our mentors. In the like, subsequent years following this, yeah. like incredible, yeah. um, because he met the mentor in year one, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And this is, this is how it all worked out. And so this happens constantly. Yeah. Well, because yeah. the thing I'm thinking as well is even when I go back to my own my own background mm-hmm. as someone who who didn't didn't have a family in music or didn't come from that background, like. I didn't have that much to put on my CV. Mm-hmm. And so what it's doing is it's it's creating opportunity for those who want to grab it. Yeah. And for them to be able to, you know, because a lot of interview questions are like, tell me about a project you've done start to finish. Exactly. And if you're someone who's at, like only worked in retail, mm-hmm. which is where I, I started, you've never been given anything like the responsibility exactly. of a project. And certainly nothing. I'm like, well, I show up at 9am and I stack the shelves and then I go home when they tell me to. Yep. So it's not, you, so it's really just creating that opportunity exactly. almost out of nothing. Exactly. And that's the entire point. And, and I always say, people always presume for measure of music that, you know, the hackathon participants are all really young. They're not. Um, one thing that's really interesting about the music industry as a whole is that, Yes, you know, you're working on lots of different projects, but you're almost never the only person, you know, I I can, like, I don't even put it on my CV. Like, I've worked two major labels, but I never put on my CV, like, worked on the Ed Sheeran campaign. I did, but with, like... (laughs) 700 other people you know? right, right, like, right. Yeah, yeah. like it's cool but like yeah. you know I think it might be in my bio that like oh I worked on the burn up weekend, whatever but like I would never put it on my CV as like worked on this campaign because I'm like yeah it's sort of 7,000 other people that worked on this campaign I don't think it's that really that impressive and so yeah. measure of music is also to help people that especially when they're you know younger in their career or transitioning into the music industry or like what like or have want to work on a different part of the industry than where they're currently even working right it gives them the opportunity to have something on their resume that matches is that yeah. so if they're interested in marketing or artist development or management or mm. the tech side they can pick a project idea that does the thing they want to do and they yeah. can put down their CV so like I've had some of my success stories people not just like entry level kids you know getting roles in the industry is people transitioning from one part like a different part of the industry or outside of music into it and being able to walk into equivalent roles because the music industry is not one that loves transferable skills as a concept Mm -hmm. Um, and so having a way we do say we do oh yes constantly but the amount of people I know whose entire job history is just going from marketing manager to senior marketing manager to director of marketing at all three major labels as their entire trajectory because that's all people seem to hire is really high and so being able to go outside the music industry and walking into a director level role in the music industry is basically unheard of. And I think our industry does best when we 
absorb those amazing talents yeah. from other industries because there's it's not that our industry does everything best no. like other industries do better with payments other industry like airlines do better with loyalty schemes yep. and so if we can absorb those talents mm-hmm. and bring the best of everything and then you're also going to get a more diverse pool of the hiring exactly. as well exactly and so i'm i've been working hard to democratize the access to the music industry with Measure Music for this exact reason is because I recognize the value of transferable skills. I recognize the value of bringing in diverse talent. And yep. so if I can help remove as many barriers as possible in order to make that happen for them, like that's by far, by all of my success stories are just that. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And as I say, it's it's a joy to be at the event and to meet the people at the hackathon or when if you do a talk or you get involved. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, Kudos to you. I'm a, you. I'm a big fan of the uh, of the Measure of Music conference. Um, so I did also want to touch on one of my other favourite things that you do. Um, can we just... Th- dep- this might age us, but you currently have 30,000 LinkedIn followers. <laughs> you didn't just hit like 35 this morning or something, I don't you? believe so. I okay. haven't looked in a bit, but I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> so I'm very excited by your followers. And I must admit, I must send a link to your posts at least once a week (laughs) because so many people hit me up Mm -hmm. looking for a job in Mm -hmm. music and you know maybe SoundCloud's hiring maybe we're not on any given week and you do this thing where every week you collate the best jobs in the music industry why did you start that and or and and how did you start that yeah that was also during COVID I was very busy during COVID (laughs) apparently you were like Um, I'm just gonna work apparently other people started baking bread I mean like I would have saved myself a lot of hassle if I started baking bread but here we are (laughs) Um, (laughs) again on the no domestic chores exactly but again I don't I don't domestic labor well Um, and so yeah so I started during COVID where I was just like it was like felt really bleak you know if you remember COVID COVID was dark yeah Um, well I was in Singapore at the time and we had like dark but different type yeah yeah. Like, I, cause I, well, I it's also even, sunshine, so yeah, that helps. Sunshine, but I just couldn't even get to the UK. Fair. So I was I was locked out. Yeah, I um, couldn't go home. So I was yeah, I was so stuck you, in the you, UK you, as they well. They made you stay here. I yeah. had to stay in Asia. Yeah. Exactly. So like I was, we were at home and I was like, everyone was losing their jobs and like everyone was real stressed and the, like there was a lot going on. So I was like, okay, cool. I was like, people are still hiring. That's good. Um, and so I was like, cool. I'm just going to make lists of people that are still hiring. That's literally my thought process was like, if, yeah. I, if I take all the people on my network where I see a post that they say they're hiring, despite everybody being laid off, that would just be like a little beacon of hope to yeah, a lot yeah. of people. Even yeah. even myself, I had like my job was really secure at the time, but I was just like, I don't know what's going to happen, you know? Um, and I was like, cool, here's all the jobs. Here are people that are hiring jo- for any kind of job um, that yeah. looked at remotely cool and that was in music or media or, you know, stuff like that. Um, and so I started doing that. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm only going to have to do this for a while because things were going to like even themselves back up again. And, was, and then like, here we are now. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are now. And it's like, it's supposed a week broken into usually three parts. Yeah. Because I'm guessing there's a character limit. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, yeah, so you have to break it into three yeah. parts. And how much work is it to collate those jobs? You, you're just probably quite well connected with all the people. So is it just a case if you see it, you Yeah, I mean, literally, it. I see it and I save it. It's really like the, so like throughout my week, I'm just, I naturally scroll on LinkedIn and I always recommend everyone else is naturally scroll on LinkedIn, like incorporate LinkedIn into your social media habits because it's a slightly better way to like deal with social media to like have some professional social media happening. So like that's part of it. But I usually scroll thing, I see, I save it. Um, and then once a, once a week, and maybe every two weeks, depending on how busy I am, I just push them all together. It, takes, it only takes like, an hour or two. It's not yeah. the, it doesn't take a lot of time to do it, um, to piece it all together. And so many people, companies will reach out and they say, hey, we hired so-and-so because yeah. of, you know, they, they said they saw your job postings and things like that. Well, I think the, the wild thing is, is it we are still a very industry-based network. Mm-hmm. I, if I share a, a job post, say for SoundCloud, mm-hmm. that might get huge traction and, and people will see that. But they kind of already have to know me or be following yeah. me to see that. Exactly. So I must admit, I see a ton of you know, I, I love to follow your posts and I do recommend them to people. But when I look, I'm like, oh, like there's there's a job at TikTok and I don't know anyone that works there. So yeah. that's cool. And then but because you, you do multi-territory as well, yeah. like I've noticed it's not just UK specific. No, it's global. So if I see a job, um, I, po- I post, I don't really care where it is. Yeah. And that's exactly why I did it. As, I mean, my network wasn't huge at the time um, and it's gotten bigger since then, obviously. But it was because it's so insular, right? Like, there's so many parts of the industry where people don't talk to each other even in the industry or outside of the industry. And then also the music industry likes to do this thing, A, where they hire friends a lot, which is great for some reason 
reasons, but otherwise, sometimes yeah. it's not. Um, yeah. But people also do things where they'll post jobs like this. Hey, does anyone know anyone that's like, you know, into marketing? I'm hiring for a role. And that will be the whole post. Yeah. Like- <laughs> and that quite often as well, they, they our industry doesn't use formal job no. boards. And also as well, like, I think I had to say this to someone the other day, like, there's a hard cost associated with posting a job on LinkedIn, mm-hmm. aka as a, as a LinkedIn formal job post and music companies we're like super tight with money so we might often just like it might be thrown up as a blog page or Mm -hmm. a page on our website and then literally like you say just a couple of the staff will be like hey we're looking exactly and that's it so it's never going to land in job seekers inboxes because exactly. they're never going to see it. Exactly. And that's exactly the reason why I did it because I recognized this was a thing constantly. And then that's also part of the reason because people always say, oh, you know, I can't find diverse talent. And I'm like, let me tell you about all the diverse <laughs> talent that happens to be following me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, and so it's a way for me to do that. And it's also a way for me to combat job boards and the other other side of things where sometimes companies will just post jobs because it looks good to investors. It looks good to the, mm. you know, the stock market that they have all these hiring, and they're hot, but they're actually real jobs. Um, yeah. And so another point Another um, important fact about all the jobs I post is I only po- uh, only add them to the roundup if a human being posts. If right. a company posts, it doesn't get added. It has to be a human at that company that posts it because you wouldn't go out of your way to post about a job that is available for your company if you weren't actually hiring. That's way too much work, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and usually because it's when it's – I love that. I hadn't even clocked mm-hmm. that that was a sort of a requirement, but it makes sense. It's like an extra layer of like fraud protection. Exactly. Um, because usually the person posting – it's either in their team or team adjacent exactly. and it will make their life better. Mm-hmm. So their 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 idea is it's a self motivated. It's post, a best of interest in it. Yep. But it also gives that extra layer mm-hmm. of validity. You wanna hear the maddest thing? Yes. So I had a friend, I'm not gonna name the company or the friend, but they worked as a growth hacker mm-hmm. in tech. Mm-hmm. And their favorite thing to do was to post jobs that did not exist mm-hmm. with a list of technical skills that were required. So these are dev jobs. And they, for the company they were working for, the new tech, they would list it as one of the requirements and they would see a 100x jump in people signing up because all the devs would go and sign up because they think they needed the skill for this job that didn't even exist. Oh, I hate that so much. Know, but have you ever heard anything so wild? <laughs> oh, no. See, I hate that unethical. so much. Growth hacking. Oh, no. Oh, I God. Know. But I, I tell this story because that's the maddest thing I've ever heard. Yes. And I couldn't believe it when they told me. I was like, it's kind of smart, but I also hate yeah. it. Yeah. But the other thing as well is I, I use it as an example because a lot of people that I talk to who are job hunting, mm-hmm. they will, they'll, they'll see a job and they'll go, it's perfect. I love it. It's, it's absolutely the job for me. And they'll spend a long time on the application and CV and they'll submit it and they might never even hear back. And they really let that get to them mm-hmm. because they saw one job and they and they just didn't even get a reply mm-hmm. and it really knocks them. And I use it as an example of, like you say, some of these aren't real. Yeah, real. Some of them, they're just... Some of them are growth hacking. Yep. Some of them are just testing the water. Yeah. Some of them are just building a pipeline. Yep. Some are hiring internally. Um, one thing that's been really great, I've built my network so much that at one point I lost my job a couple of years back and I applied for a role at a fairly big company and the HR person um, reached out to me directly and she's like, hi, um, you post a lot of our jobs, so I wanted to say that we fill that role internally, um, just giving you an FYI, thank you so much. Right. And like, I'm sure all the other people that apply for that same job probably did not get the same no. message, well, right? And because this is actually true in Singapore as well, mm-hmm. you have a legal requirement to post, ev- to post every job for, it used to be 30 days, mm. before you give it to an internal mm. or before you whatever. So, and I kind of like, I kind of get it, but I also kind of hate it. But if you're not going to do anything about it, if you're not going to use that anyway, what's the point? It's an arbitrary it's rule kind of otherwise. a band-aid that yeah. doesn't really fix exactly. the problem because instead I get maybe a hundred people ha- apply for a job that I kind of already know yeah. that I've hired, yeah. that I have the candidate. Exactly. So, but that's a legal requirement and I'm sure it's different in other countries yeah. as well. But as I say, I've noticed it really knock the confidence of some people oh, yes. who just, they apply for that thing and then they, they think, but I was so perfect. Mm-hmm. I will say as well, I don't know if I've ever said this out loud, definitely not on recording. I think I applied for a job at SoundCloud mm-hmm. in like 2015. Yeah. Did not get a reply. Oh. Yeah. But look at me now. Look at you now. Look at me now. <laughs> I'm here. But it's funny, actually, because I think I still have the automated rejection. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, I think it's funny because like I talk to people a lot um, and I've built my network up really well, things like that. And people always presume that like no one, no one ever rejects me or I never get no's. I never get things like that. And like I've also interviewed at SoundCloud and didn't get a job. I've interviewed at Spotify and didn't get a job. I've interviewed at 
I've interviewed at almost every single music and tech company, like, and have not gotten job offers. Um, you know, <laughs> I feel bad because I've, I've not interviewed at enough of them. Yeah. But one thing I do do is get fired a lot. Oh, that's fair. It's a whole other podcast. <laughs> yeah, I, qu- I quit jobs a lot. So um, oh. we have to, uh, also a whole other podcast. Oh, they have, we, to, they yeah. have to force me out. <laughs> That's a whole different conversation. It's a whole different conversation. Yes. It's a whole separate podcast where you talk about not getting hired yes. somewhere and I talk about being forcibly removed. Exactly. And then company. talk about quitting for the things I actually did get hired for. So yeah, combination. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, love that. Okay, tick, write yes. that down. Yes. Um, okay, so I've got just kind of like one or two less fun sure. questions to end on seeing how much time we have. Um, and I just like the way this question is worded. If you could wave a magic wand, what would you change in the music industry? Oh no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Oh, and it doesn't have to be like the right answer or the no, perfect no. answer or everything. Like, you know, you don't have to go world peace included. Yeah. I'm like I'm thinking about what I can say without burning like 12,000 bridges simultaneously. So I'm like, okay, what's the answer to this that like is truthful but also like not disruptive to my entire career? Okay, um, good, good to know. Good to know. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, cuz you don't want to go down the path I go down. You don't get fired all the time. <laughs> Let's see. Um Okay, if I could wave a magic wand, I think the number one thing, the thing I would focus on the most is figuring out a way to allow artists to have the same luxuries that executives have when it Mm. comes to working in, in the industry. And what I mean by that is if you're an executive at a company any music company, like a label, whatever it might be, you get healthcare, you get a pension, you get all of these things that all the most employees get, full-time employees get. Artists don't get the same luxury. There's a lot of reasons why this is, like everything from taxes to like, you know, historical reasons why this is a thing. Yeah. But like, I would love to have a world in which artists also can, you know, get the free GP, private GP service and can get the an actual pension where money is going in there and all these other things. Yeah. Um, also just get like training and development in a way that is like sustainable and feasible as well as their managers. Like I only I, I guess in my head is like artists and managers are on payroll in the same way the employees are on payroll to some right? extent. It's yeah. like that's the thing that like I would love to see probably the most with the industry. Oh, I love that. And and, and a very different answer to any I've ever heard before. Huh. So but I think you're right in terms of the almost like the the gig economy. Yeah. Um and you know, if music is ultimately a job, which it, it, is. it might start as fun and creativity, but once you become a professional artist, and um, putting that kind of that kind of stability in mm-hmm. there. Um yeah, super love that. Okay, my last question then. Um if there is one piece of advice you could give your younger self. So, because there was also the option of like giving to everyone, but yeah. you do a lot of this with your measure of yeah, music sure. and with your mentoring. <laughs> you give a lot of other people advice. So I thought it'd be more fun to ask me if, <laughs> if you could give yourself yeah. that advice. Yeah. Um, so I always say the only regret, it's not even a regret, the only thing I wish I did when it came to my career is I wish I would have done everything sooner. Um, right. And so I never, I didn't leave Baltimore until I moved abroad. I, I literally left Baltimore and moved to Stockholm jarring change <laughs> hold on the conversation there as that well classic move. yes exactly you know as one does um but i wish i had gone to you know i wish i had gone to uni in new york city like i wanted to you know i yeah. wish i had gone to grad school you know in nashville like i thought i was going to i wish i had just done the things yeah. that i wanted to do um because i was always playing it's safe i was always like cool well, i already have a job yeah. i don't need to go to new york city to get the the, the, the dream job because yeah. i have the job whatever it might be and so if i had if i did it all again i would have probably gone that route but i don't think i'd have the career i have now if i had gone that route so yeah. you know it's like a yeah. butterfly effect situation there i 100 percent agree because when i started my company mm-hmm. i was 36 mm. and the I was told by the incubator the average age of a person doing their program is 27. Mm. So I was like 10 nearly 10 years older and and I and I felt it and I could see it yeah. in action every day. But I thought I had to go back and think what is it about myself? Like why why didn't I at 27? Yeah. And I I'm glad I didn't cuz I uh, you know the tech was different back yeah. then and it might not have worked. So you can't ever truly have regrets. Exactly. But I do think there's something about me and I wonder if it's a, a a woman thing of being like we take risks but they're calculated oh, yes. risks. There's there's plans and there's like there's progressions as to exactly how this risk is going to go. Yeah. And that safe route risk is like, oh, that risk makes total sense. Yeah. That's completely feasible. Like even my investors used to laugh at me. They'd be like, you're so risk averse. You're like our most risk averse founder we have. And I was like, 
I don't know. I feel like someone who like l- like left a job, exactly. started an AI company right. at a time when everyone hates it, yeah. and is just randomly building a new market from scratch yeah. and raised you know two million dollars. That feels high risk to me. Yep. <laughs> but according to them, low risk. <laughs> low risk. Yes. Low risk. So yes. even when I moved to Stockholm, people would say they're like, "Oh my god, that's so brave for you to move to Stockholm." I was like, "They didn't take my passport. I can go back to America if I want." This wasn't that big of a jump. I promise you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I got the same when I moved to Australia. Yeah. People were like. That is the maddest thing. Like, that is so brave. And I was like, first of all, they all speak English in exactly. Australia. That's like, they do in Stockholm even, too, so. It's even, yeah, their English is fantastic. Um, but I was also like, and if I go and I don't like it, I'll just go back. You can just go back, right? No one's stopping you. They haven't. Yeah. They didn't steal my passport on the way out. You can yeah, yeah. just do the thing. So it's not like you have to sign a release right. saying I shall never return. Exactly. I always <laughs> say it was like I was like it would have been more jarring for me to move to like rural Iowa or like yeah. you know like the middle of the north in the UK than it is for me to move to like another city. I lived in a city, moved to another city. Yes, yeah, it was yeah. a bit different, but yeah. it's not that like again, it's that calculated risk. The like calculated there's a much risk. bigger risk. If I decided to like sell all my possessions and move to like Costa Rica to become a yoga instructor, that yeah. was a way bigger risk than yeah, me, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. just moving to another city so I could be closer to music and tech. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it feels like a calculated risk. Exactly. And, and maybe one a lot of people wouldn't be comfortable making yeah. um, from, from Baltimore, maybe people you grew up with. I, I definitely got that vibe. Like, there's a lot of people in my hometown that would not have done some of the yeah. things I did. But to me, it still always felt like very calculated yeah. risks. Absolutely. Um, and I wonder if that's something about our age and our upbringing or like being a woman as well and being a little bit more thoughtful about the decisions we make. Yes, definitely. I am, like I mentioned earlier, I'm first generation Americans. My parents did the thing. They came from Nigeria to America around the same age. I decided to bounce over to Europe. Um, right. and so that was much more jarring for them than it was for me. Um, yep. So I always kind of saw that as like, oh, this is, this is doable. Yeah. You, this is easy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and my parents lived in Saudi in the 70s oh, yeah. so that they could, um, like cause my dad come from a very working class background mm-hmm. so he could save up enough money for a house Amazing. deposit. Yeah. And that to me was like, oh, you lived in the Middle East in the 70s? Like, you know, yeah. like that was, that feels bolder. Exactly, right. You know? Much bigger than yeah. like what I did. You know? Exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so much bigger than what I did as well. So, so to me, it always, it always felt calculated, yeah. but there is a part of me as well. If, if that's your one thing that you wish you could tell your younger self, I would love to have seen what a bold 27 year old Hazel could have done. Right. You know, but I just didn't have it. Yeah. I didn't have it back then. Yeah. You know, I completely, I agree. I, I didn't see it, couldn't be it. Exactly. I mean, like, I'm like, would I be, would I be the a label president now if I had decided to make that leap at 17? Who knows? But yeah, yeah. yeah. Or there's just as much chance that you know, because I, I only learned at 27 um, that not everybody is gonna like you forever. So that took me a long time to learn. Oh. So I feel like 27 year old Hazel would maybe have not made great business decisions, oh, yeah. um, and so therefore may have just gone terribly. Fair, fair. I learned that early on, but I've not. I, I have. I have learned to become a more likable person over time as opposed to the opposite way around. So it's like that. I was not, I was a very jarring person at 17 to up till probably like 25. Um, I cannot imagine it. Yeah, that's nice. Um, cannot. <laughs> but also, I was, I do know, yeah, I'm just so, one of the shocking things to me was that I thought up until 27, if I was just nice enough, I could make someone like me. Oh, that's great. Until I met a few people where it did not matter. Yeah. How much? And I was at a major label. Yeah. And it just did not matter how many favors I did, how much work I helped them yeah. with, how much I invited them to lunch, mm-hmm. how much I grabbed them a coffee. They just didn't like you. Hate yeah. me. It's so funny because I think it never concerned me what po- people thought about me. Never. I was never a people pleaser. I never cared what people thought about me again. Yeah. I was a bit jarring. So it was probably the opposite <laughs> situation yeah. there. Um, but it just, I, I, like, I have learned over time that, like, trying to be more, like, not even, I wouldn't say I'm even close to people pleaser, but trying to be a more agreeable person is probably better. Um, right, right. But I would just say whatever was on my mind constantly. Yeah. I would just do the thing constantly. I was yeah. like, I started reading through, like, old, like, Tumblrs and live journals. I was like, oh my God, I was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> A nightmare person. I 
I'm shocked by how awful I was. And so looking back now, it's, I probably would have had the we opposite We were so lucky issue. we didn't have TikTok when we were like 12 or 13. <laughs> also, like, we didn't know each other because it sounded like you were pro- t- too busy trying to people please me. Yeah, and, and I would have been such an awful person to you. So. And I would have been like, why does she hate me? I've done so much and I just can't get her to like me. And I would have been devastated. Exactly. So it sounds um, like it's much better than we met now too. So that's worth it. Brilliant that we met in the middle. Um, yeah, absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you. Such a fun chat. This was so great. As always. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on the Museo by SoundCloud podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.